Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, not one but two very nice uh, introductions. So I wanted to thank uh, you, Dean uh, uh, Shannon Hader, and Professor Michael Brenner for their uh, very kind uh, words. And I also want to acknowledge the hard work that went into putting this uh, event together. There are a lot of uh, moving parts here uh, to put an event like this together. So I want to thank Ambassador Piper Campbell, who's the chair of my department, the Department of Foreign Policy and Global Security, Heather McGann, who's sitting here in the room, uh, Laura Cutler, who's the managing director of the Center for Israel Studies, our uh, AU and SIS comms teams, and especially Emma Vitali and Jonathan Skidmore, for uh, both of whom spent many, many hours um, uh, on, this, uh, on this event. And uh, I know this sounds like an Academy Awards speech with all the thank yous, but I also <laughs> lastly want to thank all of you, former students, current students, faculty, colleagues, uh, for joining us today. Um, I know that uh, there are some beautiful trees out here on campus to look at, and you chose to, to be indoors on such a nice day. So I appreciate everybody spending a part of your afternoon here um, with me. Um, so last week, uh, uh, Professor Brenner in his talk talked about how I, I submitted, uh, I wrote my book before uh, October 7th, and I actually submitted the final edits, the final proofs, was told I cannot add a single dot uh, to uh, my manuscript on Friday, October 6th. And I was wondering, how am I going to even spend the weekend after weekend after weekend, month after month, uh, uh, you know, working on this book? And then October 7th hits, and uh, guess what? I had to write uh, an afterword, which did not take a lot of convincing uh, to my publisher. Um, so last week, uh, US Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who is the highest ranking Jewish uh, elected official in the United States, gave um, a historic speech. And in this speech, he said that, and I'm quoting, Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing the political survival to take precedence over the best interests of Israel, quote unquote. Something he would never have said in the past, uh, something that really kind of threw a lot of people off. And while Israelis were mulling his words and a lot of American politicians and members of the Jewish community were mulling his words, um, I have to say that the Israeli national security community had reached this very conclusion a long time ago. And just yesterday, the 555 Patriots Forum, which is a group of former Israeli Air Force pilots, issued a statement in which they backed Schumer's statement and his call for Netanyahu to declare early elections. And so this brings me to why I even wrote the book, which was the paradox that I thought was very interesting, which was that Netanyahu had this image that he had self-cultivated over many years of being the nation's Mr. Security, quote unquote. Um, and this was an image that was accepted by and large by the Israeli public for decades, until recently. Um, yet it was an image that was rejected by the Israeli national security community. So I thought this this paradox and this disconnect uh, is very interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon, interesting puzzle to explore. Um, in terms of my, the scholarship I use to, to write this book, I draw on both the uh, civil military relations literature as well as the scholarship on populism. And these are two distinct literatures that normally are not studied together, but I thought both of them are necessary to explain uh, what we've seen here. And my research is based on dozens of uh, interviews with uh, former uh, Israeli security officials, including um, high-ranking generals and former chiefs of the, of the Mossad and Shin Bet intelligence uh, services, uh, as well as Israeli pollsters. And I had many other um, off-the-record uh, conversations with uh, Israeli scholars and uh, some politicians as well and various civil society uh, leaders. My key argument is that to explain this puzzle of why the public has largely stood by Netanyahu, or at least his policies, if not always by the man himself, despite the opposition of the security establishment to uh, Netanyahu's approach, I look at the decline in the status of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, the army, over the years. And, um, and so, so regarding the, the declining status, uh, this, in turn, fed uh, or, or created the space, the political space, for populist nationalists to then attack some of these ex-generals, some of these security officials, including 
uh, acting uh, security officials who um, might have a different approach than, uh, than they do. And, uh, and this is how they have been able to come to power and reduce further the status of the generals. There are, when you look at the contentious relationship between the security establishment and Netanyahu, there are really three major reasons uh, and, and three major differences between them and Netanyahu. Uh, we're looking at a lack of an agreement on the issues, on his approach, a lack of confidence in Netanyahu, and ultimately a lack of trust in Netanyahu. And I'll start with lack of, of, of an agreement. The primary goal of uh, the security establishment, by and large, is the goal of pursuing the Zionist dream, which is really the idea of securing a Jewish and a democratic state. One cannot exist without the other according to traditional Zionism. And this is something that the vast majority of uh, generals, uh, a position that the vast majority of generals hold. Yet the direction in which Israel has been moving in has been the direction towards a binational state. And that direction is dangerous as far as they're concerned because that would lead Israel to either become a, an apartheid regime, i.e. not a democracy, which is antithetical to their thinking, or a non-Jewish state uh, that would be where in, in a state in which Jews would become the minority eventually, uh, given demographic reality. So neither of these scenarios is, uh, is, is acceptable to the vast majority of members of the security establishment. And that is why they, by and large, disagree with the approach taken by Netanyahu and his supporters. And so as a result, over the years, there have been many disagreements primarily on the Palestinian issue, but not exclusively on the Palestinian issue, on the Iranian nuclear uh, issue, or at least how to best, best thwart the Iranian nuclear program has also been an area of contention between uh, Netanyahu and the generals. With respect to lack of confidence, uh, they see Netanyahu as a man of rhetoric, not action. He is somebody who relishes in giving speeches and some very powerful speeches over the years. They're not impressed with, with, with the speeches. They also see him as having exercised over the years very poor judgment. And this dates not to recent times, but to his very first term as prime minister. In 1996, he, uh, in his very first year in office, he decided to open a, uh, an entrance to a Hasmonean tunnel in Jerusalem, which sparked major violence in contrast to the recommendations of the security establishment uh, at the time. He also uh, tried to poison Hamas leader Kamel, uh, Khaled Mashal in 1997, uh, who was in Jordan at the time. It was a bungled operation, and Netanyahu then had to send the agents back to Jordan to administer the antidote, thus saving the very Hamas leader's life that he tried to end. Last year, we saw the judicial overhaul attempts and the impact that it had on national security. Uh, I'll get to that uh, in, uh, a little bit later. Um, and of course, October 7th, which was the single greatest terrorist attack in Israel's history. And finally, I mentioned lack of trust as another major uh, difference between Netanyahu and the generals. From day one, Netanyahu sidelined the security establishment in, from the decision-making process, which was a critical departure uh, from the norm. And they feel that he has put increasingly his personal and political interests ahead of the national security interests. And so that, in a nutshell, explains why the, the generals and the rest of the security establishment um, are, are, are so frustrated by Netanyahu and why they want to see him uh, go home. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this, the nature of civil military relations in Israel because traditionally the, civilian, uh, the civilians rule over the military and that's not that different in Israel, but the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, has traditionally taken a more active role in um, political life than is typically the case in, in most Western uh, democracies. Yoram Perry refers to this as a partnership, quote unquote, between the generals and the politicians. And, the, and although a coup has never been a realistic possibility, oversight of the IDF has also never really been strong. If you want to know more about that, I recommend you read Boaz Atzili's book. My colleague who's sitting somewhere here uh, has written, oh, right here, sorry, <laughs> right here has written a great book on this very topic. 
the most visible manifestation of, this, of the blurred lines between the military and civilian spheres um, is the uniquely Israeli phenomenon among contemporary democracies of senior military officials parachuting into politics upon retirement. So there's a long tradition of uh, ex-generals. Once they retire, uh, they aim for the top civilian spot. Most of them, of course, don't, don't get there. But three of Israel's 13 prime ministers were retired generals. Um, the vast majority of the IDF chiefs of staff have gone into politics upon their retirement. Only three or four have not as of today. Um, and ex-generals see this as a way of further contributing to uh, national service uh, after, their, uh, after their retirement from the military. Now, what's significant here is that the vast majority of these former security officials, when they do join politics, they tend to identify with, pol with uh, uh, parties to the left of the dominant ruling Likud party, which is Netanyahu's uh, political uh, party. Um, it is not a coincidence that the first right-wing Israeli prime minister chose to give senior roles to ex-generals. Uh, um, uh, Yadin, Dayan, Weitzman, Sharon, uh, this was all an important step uh, from their end to uh, legitimize uh, their governments. Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir, another right-wing prime minister, appointed Rabin, former IDF chief of staff Yitzhak Rabin, as his defense minister. And Netanyahu did the same. Netanyahu appointed ex-general Yitzhak Mordechai to serve as his defense minister in his first government and other generals in some of his subsequent governments. Their, uh, the general's more dovish reputation was underscored by the emerging pattern that we've seen over the years of disillusionment with their uh, boss's hardline policies, primarily towards uh, the Palestinians. Moshe Dayan famously resigned from the foreign ministry when he concluded that Menachem Begin, the prime minister at the time, wasn't serious about the Palestinian autonomy negotiations. His resignation was followed a year later by Ezer Weizmann's uh, departure for the same reason. Weizmann was the defense minister. When Yitzhak Mordechai, Netanyahu's first defense minister, was forming talks uh, with the IDF chief of staff at the time, the, out the outgoing uh, IDF chief of staff, Amnon Lifkin Shachak, to form a centrist party, Netanyahu promptly fired him. They challenged him in the 1999 elections. And it was another ex-general, former IDF chief Ehud Barak, who ultimately defeated uh, Netanyahu. And so Netanyahu's conclusion after this humiliating uh, defeat in 1999 was that the generals represented the single greatest obstacle to his political career. Um, he orchestrated uh, a, a decade later through his uh, allies, his political allies, what's known as the Chalutz Law. Dan Chalutz was then the IDF chief of staff. He was then very popular, and it was widely assumed that he would be uh, running for office. And so uh, Netanyahu's uh, colleagues uh, passed a bill that lengthened the cooling off period between um, six months to three years. Now, Normally, in a healthy democracy, that's a good thing to have to kind of leave some more time uh, between uh, the general, you know, generals retiring and then running for office. Um, it is uh, something that, that could be seen as healthy, and certainly that was the rationale behind this, this bill uh, publicly. But behind the scenes, the real reason uh, for doing so was because Netanyahu and his allies saw these ex-generals as powerful political threats. And uh, by the time they would run for office three years later, some of that luster would have been gone. They're not as popular. They're not as well known. And some of them might even be too old uh, to run uh, for public office. Um, several years ago in 2019, 2020, there were a number of back-to-back -back elections. We saw an unprecedented phenomenon in which in each of these elections, three ex-IDF chiefs of staff bandied together to challenge Netanyahu. Um, and uh, while uh, these elections produced uh, the stalemate, which is why there were so many elections uh, in a back-to-back -back way, this does show you how the security establishment really lined up against uh, Netanyahu. But it also demonstrates that over the years, uh, they had lost some of their clout. The fact that three IDF chiefs and then others that joined later could not really decisively defeat Netanyahu 
does, uh, does show the kind of reduced clout that the generals who once had this heroic image no longer had. Um, a few words about IDF influence in government policy. Uh, the IDF has, over the years, had a lot of autonomy, as I mentioned earlier, more autonomy than is typically the case in most Western democracies. Uh, when Ariel Sharon uh, was a young uh, commando, uh, commander in 1955, he carried out a series of counterterrorism uh, reprisal raids without even securing the approval of then Prime Minister Moshe Charette. In the mid-1960s, it became the norm for generals uh, to be interviewed by journalists and provide political commentary, including Yitzhak Rabin, who was then the IDF uh, chief of staff. And Israel's decision to go to war in 1967, in June 67, was driven by the generals. They had actually lobbied and campaigned for, uh, for the prime minister to preempt this war a year earlier, in 1966. Uh, there was quite a bit of tension between them and Prime Minister Eshkol at the time, but Eshkol said he's not going to do this until he gets the green light, or at least the amber light, from President Lyndon Johnson. Once he got that, um, the, the rest is history, and Israel did preempt that war in June of 67. In the late 1980s, um, the IDF top brass was instrumental in pushing uh, Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, into the negotiating process with the PLO. They felt that the occupation was um, a very significant burden on the IDF, a very significant burden on the military to maintain uh, the military occupation. And so in the wake of this first Palestinian intifada, the advice uh, that he and, and others in the security establishment gave was, you got to deal with the PLO. Um, after the uh, Declaration of Principles was signed, heralding the new Oslo era in September of 93, Rabin Prime Minister Rabin brought in the generals into his cabinet. This was the book that, uh, that uh, Perry wrote on this uh, topic. And the IDF continued to play a major role in the uh, peace process with the Palestinians uh, after Rabin's assassination when Shimon Peres took over as the uh, sitting uh, prime minister. This ended once Netanyahu came to power. He, did, he distanced uh, the generals from the decision-making process. He kind of viewed them with suspicion. He saw them as part of the left and decided to exclude them from uh, the uh, political process and, and other decision-making um, uh, forums. Over the years, um, the IDF has been viewed as what they call the people's army. This is an important source of national pride. It's uh, also a way of social integration. Uh, that embodies many of the Zionist ideals. David Ben-Gurion, the founding father of the State of Israel, saw the IDF as a melting pot, uh, as a unifying institution, not just a military institution. And Israel's victories in the first uh, major wars, the 1948 war, the Sinai campaign of 1956, and the 1967 war, reinforced time and again the fighting spirit of the IDF and its deaf generals. Um, the war produced uh, a kind of a euphoric atmosphere in Israel, especially the 1967 war. There's the iconic photograph of Israeli paratroopers standing in front of the Western Wall in Jerusalem, taken from Jordan, uh, which underscored the centrality of the IDF to national security and national pride in Israel. But the word of an active or retired security official no longer resonates today as it once did. Long gone are the days when a statement or, or warning by a revered general like a Moshe Dayan or a Tzhak Rabin can, can sway significantly uh, public opinion. And one of the major turning points here is the 1973 war, the Yom Kippur War, uh, where Israel was caught unprepared in the October 6 surprise attack. Happened almost to the day 50 years before the October 7th attack. And this war was seen as an absolutely disastrous war, the IDF's reputation was severely damaged, and the generals were just no longer seen as invincible. And since that war, there have been multiple uh, operations and wars that have left Israel uh, in doubt of its own confidence, of its own ability to, uh, decide, to decisively defeat uh, the enemy. The 1982 Lebanon War, for example, was a very costly one. Uh, it's considered to be Israel's Vietnam. 
the 2006 war against Hezbollah, that's the second Lebanon war, also uh, uh, was seen as kind of a military failure. The fact that Hezbollah still remained uh, stronger than before and has been able to rebuild itself um, and, and do quite a bit of damage uh, definitely um, uh, impacted the way that uh, Israelis saw their, their army. And similarly, all of these Gaza wars that we've seen in the past uh, 15 years also have produced um, this kind of notion that the IDF is no longer able to produce uh, this decisive victories in an era of asymmetric uh, threats. And in addition to these military failures or perceived failures, there are also two controversial policies that further damaged uh, the IDF's reputation, at least among uh, the right, the Israeli right. One is its association with the Oslo peace process, which fell apart many years ago. And the other is Sharon's decision, or Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon's decision, to disengage from the Gaza Strip, uh, which did not produce uh, peace for Israelis. So the generals are associated with these policies, and that further reduced uh, their clout. So it's against this backdrop that the nationalist politicians have attacked the security establishment as part of their uh, populist playbook. Um, one, of the interesting, um, one of the interesting findings in the populist uh, literature on Israeli populism in particular is that this is not Israel's first experience with populism. Netanyahu is not the first populist prime minister. Uh, that designation goes to Menachem Begin. The difference, however, is pretty significant. Uh, Menachem Begin, uh, his version of populism is what Donny Phil calls, calls uh, inclusive populism. He was able to tap into the frustrations of the uh, Mizrahi working poor, those who were disenfranchised, marginalized in Israeli society, um, and, uh, and, and he was able to speak to them and brought them into politics, uh, where today they're very much part of the mainstream, uh, despite the fact that uh, the prime minister himself is uh, Ashkenazi, and most prime ministers have been Ashkenazi, but still uh, the Mizrahi community saw Menachem Begin as kind of their hero from bringing them into the, uh, into the mainstream. With Netanyahu, we've seen a, what we call an exclusive form of populism, the kind of us versus them approach. And the them includes the Arabs, uh, the elite, the left. Uh, and that is uh, uh, constantly evoked by Netanyahu and, um, and his political allies. We've seen a slew of illiberal bills, illiberal legislation during the Netanyahu era. The most controversial piece of legislation was the 2018 Jewish nation state law, which declared Israel the nation state solely of the Jewish people, omitting any references to equality or minority rights, uh, which are very clearly stated in Israel's Declaration of Independence, but not mentioned at all in this uh, legislation. The media, both social and traditional, has um, been used by Netanyahu even as he has fiercely attacked the media. During the Trump era, uh, we even heard Netanyahu refer to the media in the same kind of language, same kind of, uh, 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 the same kind of uh, rhetoric that Trump used, he adopted as well. So we heard him talk about fake news or the witch hunt to describe how he felt the media was treating him and his family, even words like deep state that have ne had never really been uttered before in Israel became part of the uh, discourse. Social media as well has emerged as maybe the primary battlefield in which uh, Netanyahu uh, has um, fought against his critics. His elder son, Yair, is very active on social media, maintains his, his own uh, social media accounts, and routinely attacks the heads of the security establishment, um, which, uh, which, and he also is seen as a, uh, an advisor uh, unofficially, but very much an advisor to the prime minister. The year 2016 represents a key turning point in this kind of open assault against the IDF. Uh, there were two back-to-back -back events. Uh, the main one was the El Or Azaria case. This involved a uh, soldier, an Israeli soldier, who was arrested for shooting an unarmed Palestinian assailant. This was caught on, uh, on film, on camera. And his commanders uh, uh, 
punished him and jailed him for violating the IDF code of ethics. Uh, the, uh, this was seen as a very unpopular move by the commanders who were doing what uh, many Israelis felt uh, was unfair to a soldier that could have been their own son, uh, somebody that they knew who was just trying to protect himself and other Israelis, and populist nationalists pounced on this case, openly attacked uh, the IDF and the, and the political establishment for backing the commanders, and Netanyahu eventually called the parents and, and joined the populist nationalists in this, uh, in this kind of struggle. And the second incident uh, concerns the deputy, the former deputy IDF chief. At the time, he was the deputy IDF chief of staff, Yair Golan. He gave a speech at the Holocaust Remembrance Day in which he talked about Israelis needing to engage in a deep reflection and nip the buds of intolerance, the buds of violence, the buds of self-destruction on the road to moral degradation, I'm quoting. And he mentioned in his speech that some of the processes he was witnessing were similar to the processes that uh, we saw that took place during the Weimar Republic. So as you can imagine, this sparked quite a bit of outrage, and he was uh, soundly attacked by populist politicians and ultimately denied a promotion, so never became a uh, chief of staff, even though he was designated for that position, uh, denied a promotion, and today he is trying to lead the Israeli political left. This assault on the security establishment is a very significant development on the IDF, on what has been called the People's Army. And, uh, and while in typical democracies, keeping the military in check is a sign of democratic robustness, in Israel, weakening them is also weakening uh, the gatekeepers. They are seen as gatekeepers of Israeli democracies. There was a, a, a film, a documentary called The Gatekeepers about a decade or two ago which highlighted not the IDF, but the uh, Shin Bet uh, internal security, domestic security service as serving that role of a gatekeeper on, uh, on uh, the Israeli government. And we've seen increasingly attacks on sitting as well as retired security officials in the Netanyahu era. I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples here. One is Netanyahu's former minister of public security, Gilad Erdan, who is now the ambassador uh, to the UN when uh, a civil society group called the Commanders for Israel Security, it includes former high-ranking IDF chiefs of staff and uh, former uh, generals, former heads of the Mossad and Shin Bet uh, uh, security services, um, when they talked about the need to revive the peace process and prevent uh, a binational state from emerging, uh, Gilad Erdan uh, said, didn't you learn a lesson from Oslo and from bringing Arafat into the area from the disengagement? from your support for withdrawing from the Golan and in the agreement with Assad, it's time to use rank, it's time to stop using rank to promote political positions. Say it clearly, we are leftists who oppose a presence in Judea and Samaria because this is the truth, stop wearing a costume. And this is a view that is widely reflected among many of Netanyahu's uh, political allies. One of them, David Bitan, complained that the Israeli intelligence chiefs essentially become leftists in their post. He's called a Shin Bet cowardly. And uh, Miri Regev, who's another uh, Netanyahu ally, calls the security services delusional. Um, and after Netanyahu's supporters attacked the army commanders for being weak, um, the IDF chief of staff at the time, uh, Kohavi, issued a, st uh, a special statement defending uh, the IDF. This was. Uh, in relation to a soldier, an Israeli soldier who was uh, fatally shot, and, uh, and therefore more attacks uh, ensued against the IDF top echelon. Today we continuously hear, even in the midst of the war, of the Gaza war, we continuously see more and more attacks by nationalist politicians, um, which has led, not surprisingly, to an erosion of public trust in nearly every institution. What's interesting, however, is that despite the erosion of public trust in these institutions, despite the attacks on the IDF, the IDF remains the most uh, trusted institution in the state of Israel, even today, and despite their reduced clout. Um, a very recent poll, I think within the last week or so, finds that 86.5% of the public have trust in the IDF. Um, this is far, far greater than trust in the government, trust in the Knesset, 
trust in uh, the, the Supreme Court and, uh, and every other institution. Uh, and every poll, I should note, taken since October 7th have found uh, that Israelis trust the IDF significantly more than their government. So this brings me to last year, 2023, which was a very pivotal uh, year. And this is the year that Netanyahu essentially lost his Mr. Security image. The 2023 judicial overhaul protests uh, essentially paralyzed the country. We saw week after week, um, hundreds of uh, thousands of Israelis. Uh, at one point, I think I saw a, a survey that showed that 20% of all Israelis participated in at least one of these demonstrations, and, and, uh, and many of them participated on a weekly basis. And the security establishment was involved. Many of the reservists in the IDF, including reservists of top uh, units, very elite units, joined in the protest and even threatened not to serve, uh, not to fulfill their reserve duty if the judicial overhaul passed. And this is part of the kind of right-wing agenda to weaken the Supreme Court. And uh, this was something that uh, the Israelis, including many supporters of Netanyahu and Likud, uh, decided uh, to, to fight against. And uh, as I said, this paralyzed the country and when Netanyahu fired his defense minister, Yoav Gallant, for calling for a suspension of the uh, judicial overhaul legislation, there were spontaneous demonstrations all over the country in support of the defense minister who said that he, while he supports some of the legislation or the idea behind it, uh, he feels that the current trajectory is leading to a weakening of uh, national security in Israel, and therefore he called for its suspension against Netanyahu's wishes. And seeing all these demonstrations take place forced Netanyahu to undo the firing, basically, to reinstate him, a sense, or not really fire him. Uh, and he remains to this day a critic, an internal critic, but he remains to this day the defense minister. And that may have been one significant turning point where the public no longer uh, has viewed uh, Netanyahu as Mr. Security. So very, very important turning point. And the other, of course, was October 7th, where uh, even Netanyahu's uh, stalwart supporters um, abandoned him after October 7th, and he has been losing in every single poll. Were elections held today, he would lose significantly. There's no way he'd be able to form any kind of coalition if elections were held today. Uh, what's interesting, by the way, is that every major security official has taken responsibility for the disasters of October 7th. Netanyahu, however, has not, has not done so. So I want to uh, talk about a few implications here uh, before I close. One is that Israeli democracy hangs in the balance. Who will prevail ultimately? Is it going to be the populist nationalist politicians or the gatekeepers of Israeli democracy? It is too soon to to draw any kind of conclusions here on that front. Um, th this is all part of a culture war in Israel that has escalated dramatically in the past year. Another implication is US-Israel relations that are being impacted by all of these developments that I'm describing. We're seeing a growing partisan divide here in this country, and I might even add on our campus to some extent, over Israel. Um, and so what will happen with this rift uh, in the years ahead also remains to be seen including uh, this year, we have a very important presidential year. How is this going to affect uh, President Biden's reelection chances? Uh, again, we are, uh, we're, we've yet to see how this will uh, impact it in November. Um, and finally, there's going to be significant economic ramifications. Uh, if Israel becomes this illiberal state, if its democracy is a thing of, becomes a thing of the past, um, it's, it will no longer be the startup nation that it has long been known for. Uh, last year, uh, Moody's Investor Services warned about negative consequences. Recently, it downgraded Israel's credit rating, and we're seeing potential flight of human capital from Israel uh, if, if these developments uh, continue. Um, I do want to end on a more positive note. So two comments uh, on a positive, to end on a positive note. The first is that this pro-democracy movement that I, that I mentioned, where, which brought out so many Israelis, uh, as I said, uh, you know, more than 20% of Israelis partook in at least one or more of them. Um, this played a key role, and, and, and one in which the army also played a pivotal role. This played a key role in uh, stymieing the uh, right-wing efforts to 
to undercut the Supreme Court, uh, even before October 7th. And, um, and so this could be seen almost as a, as a master class on how other people in other countries, including maybe our own, might respond to attempts in their countries to undermine the foundations of democracy and pursue uh, illiberal, an illiberal uh, turn. Um, and so I, while the judicial overhaul isn't, de isn't uh, dead, it is on the back burner for now, and, uh, and we are still seeing some demonstrations taking place by the very organizers who began their protests uh, last year. And secondly and lastly, tragic events can sometimes bring about positive change. So while it's difficult to imagine anyone really talking about peace right now when we're trying to think of ways to end the war in Gaza, uh, we need to keep in mind that four years after the Yom Kippur War, Anwar Sadat visited Israel and subsequently, subsequently signed the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty. The first intifada, Palestinian intifada, paved the way to the Oslo Agreement. So it is not inconceivable that an American brokered Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement, something that both President uh, Biden and uh, former President Trump indicate they want to do, uh, could lead to a Palestinian state down the road and a future peace with Israel. I want to end on that note, and I'll be happy to open it up for questions. And if you and if uh, you can also identify yourself. Okay, my yeah. name is Herbert Grossman. Uh, I'm a retired judge. Uh, you uh, understand that uh, uh, the Israeli public no longer votes for uh, retired generals the way they had in the past. Don't you recognize that the reason for that is that they didn't real that they voted for generals thinking that they would take a hard line. Uh, for the right, and it turned out a lot of those generals were on the left, and so uh, they were being deluded into voting for those generals on a false pretense. And so they're waking up finally after 30 or 40 years of doing that. Now, why do you consider that to be undemocratic? I think it's democratic that they should vote for people who they really think are going to fulfill the policies that they're in favor of. Yeah, I don't think that's undemocratic at all. They can vote for who they want. And I think what it shows is not a disillusionment with the generals who are running. I think it just shows that not every general makes for a good politician. Most of them don't make good politicians. I think it's as, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, some of the generals form their own parties or merge with other parties. And when you're competing against Netanyahu, who has long been known as a political magician, that's not easy to do even for a very seasoned politician, let alone somebody who had never been in politics who simply enters politics upon retirement. Um, I think there are, I forgot to mention, there are two microphones. So maybe we can, um, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question can just uh, stand up. Should I? Dan Raviv, okay. you're being a gentleman. and Stop being a gentleman. Stop being a gentleman. All right, fine. Be Israeli. Uh, kidding. Uh, I, I'm Dan Raviv. I've written also about Israeli uh, security and US-Israel relations guy. Um, Today, I found it disturbing. Of course, when you hear a headline, it's often disturbing, and it's that Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said in a speech to the Israeli people, this will be a year of war and a year of victory. And it, it, it's worth keeping in mind, would you agree, that the way things sound when you're in Israel and the Defense Minister is trying to prepare the people for a big struggle, but overseas it sounded like, oh, well, that's what we do. That's what Israel is. It's into war right now, and Gallant is known, isn't it true, to favor invading Lebanon to settle the Hezbollah problem. So uh, if you talk about how things sound when you're inside Israel, but Israeli politicians have to remember the world's listening. That's right. I think that that uh, example uh, attests to the disconnect between the discourse you hear in Israel and the discourse you hear in the United States. They, it's almost like they're speaking a, a two different languages uh, in describing their agendas and describing their priorities and describing what they want to do. And as you mentioned, I think uh, Gallant was really only referring to uh, you know, his own domestic audience, not thinking about how this, could, uh, how this could come across. I would have to study what he said. I, I was teaching this morning, so I did not have a chance to look at these comments. As you can see how that quote is provocative sounding. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Why don't we kind of switch back and forth here? 
So my name is Piper Campbell, and I'm chair of the Department of Foreign Policy and Global Security here at AU. And Guy is a member of our faculty. And Guy, I just want to say how proud we are of you in the department, and um, what a great job you've done. Thank you uh, for this book launch and this book talk, as well as everything else that you do in the department. Um, as a former diplomat, I am somewhat a skeptic of national security establishments, including because I, I've seen, including in the United States, that um, the sort of the burnished image that is often given of people of a military background in terms of this presumption of their ability to make, to be decisive, to lead well, et cetera, in many cases doesn't come out that way when they're put into political positions. And I guess I, I wanted to ask, as you were having these conversations that led to the, the development of this book, to what extent did you feel that there were, were camps or divisions within the national security establishment that in fact would come more out into the open if they weren't kind of pulled together in opposition to Netanyahu? Okay, that's a good question, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Campbell. Um, I, one of the interesting uh, observations that I made when I interviewed a lot of these ex-generals is that even the ones that are not on the same page politically seem to belong to the same club in a way. And so I asked, for example, some of the more uh, mainstream uh, ex-generals who support a two-state solution and, and some of the things I mentioned in my talk, uh, how they would feel about somebody like a Bogi Alon, a former uh, defense minister turned Netanyahu critic, um, how they would feel if he became prime minister. He is uh, outspoken against the Palestinian state. He's a conservative, despite being uh, a critic of Netanyahu. And, and I asked several, and I got the same answer from several of them, which was, he, he's one of us, and we trust him. We don't trust Netanyahu, and once he, if he were to become prime minister, he would see the same things that we've seen and that we're seeing, and he'd reach the right conclusion. And so to me, that, that tells me a little bit more about the mindset of the generals and how they see one another, uh, despite some differences among them. They're not all dovish, they're not all left-leaning, and they're not all political, by the way. Uh, but there's still something that they have in common, a common thread that kind of binds them together um, which separates them from Netanyahu, who is very much a politician and not an ex-general. Hello, my name is Naomi Nyerman. I'm a Sabra, um, long living here in the United States. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, can you explain to what extent Netanyahu's policies shaped the conditions that was so weak on the Gaza side versus the West Bank, where I gather lots of soldiers were diverted? And secondly, to what extent do you see a possibility that he would call for an election before the end of the war? Um, I, the second part is an easier one to answer, because it doesn't look like he's interested in holding an election. And, I forget which uh, U.S. broadcaster interviewed him very recently on this, and, uh, and he, um, he, he, he didn't answer her question despite her asking him four times uh, if he would do so, because all the polls in Israel show that Israelis want to have uh, elections. Some want them right now, immediately. Uh, some are willing to wait after the war, but the vast majority of Israelis, overall majority, want to see early elections. I don't think that that's in the cards. I think that now would have to be forced uh, to hold uh, early elections, and as of right now, there, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. With respect to the Gaza Strip and where the soldiers are stationed, uh, this has been a problem for years and years and years, not just in the days leading to October 7th, and the communities in southern Israel have long uh, felt abandoned by the government um, uh, for not really securing and protecting them. A lot of them are kibbutzim, and have left-wing uh, politics. Uh, these are not kind of natural constituencies for the right-wing Israeli governments. And, uh, and in contrast to the settler lobby, which is very strong, very powerful, and now that there's no more Jewish settlements in the Gaza Strip, um, 
and, and all of them are located in the West Bank and, and in East Jerusalem, they're, they're willing to uh, funnel all the resources and energy into supporting them. And I think we might see some of this come out of a future investigative report um, into the failures that led to uh, October 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor. Um, thank you. Uh, this is an amazing lecture. I have so many questions, but I'm going to try to uh, shorten it down. Um, first, uh, just one about uh, tools. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, in the aftermath of 1973 war and increasingly throughout the years as Israel has had fewer and fewer uh, decisive wars to fight, uh, that public trust in the credentials of uh, IDF uh, chiefs of staff and the generalship has eroded. Uh, but is there, a, beyond that, are there any tools that uh, Netanyahu specifically uses to convince the public that he is a security guy when the security establishment does not agree with him? Uh, my second uh, question is about conversations uh, within civil military relations. I'm trying to keep this short. Uh, I know that there's disagreement uh, about the facts on the ground of uh, some of the settler leaders, the ultranationalist politicians, uh, who think that there are fewer uh, Palestinians uh, located in the West Bank than there actually are, and and different different facts on the ground that they're using to justify their political cases. So I'm wondering what the conversations between IDF generalship, the chief of staff, et cetera, and those civilian politicians who advocate for more settlement in the West Bank or annexation, whatever that may look like, how do those tends to play out if you have any insights on that? Thank you. Um, so with respect to your first, thank you, Theo. Um, I don't know if you mentioned your names. If anybody can mention their names, just uh, uh, the set the uh, I'll answer your first question. So Netanyahu basically sets the agenda in Israel. He sets the tone. He sets the uh, the discourse. And so uh, part of the uh, political problem is for the for the opposition is that there has been virtually no opposition. That's one of the reasons Netanyahu has been able to maintain uh, power over the years. Um, he is very good at messaging and, uh, and packaging a message. Um, that is not something that uh, the generals or ex-generals are particularly equipped to do, nor are the mainstream Israeli politicians to the left of Netanyahu very good at it. And so I think we're really only seeing kind of one major line of rhetoric, and most of the opposition you're hearing about is mostly personal about Netanyahu rather than uh, the vision or lack of vision or the approach. It's, uh, so that's, that's uh, my answer to your first question. As far as the generals and the settlers are concerned, so the, you know, it's hard to know exactly what's happening behind closed doors. What I can tell you is that sitting generals and sitting heads of the security establishment, when they're meeting with um, the, the, uh, the Knesset members and the ministers who represent or support the settlers, um, a lot of these meetings are leaked. So there, there's, there are leaks uh, of these meetings. And there are oftentimes contentious conversations taking place between the politicians, the Netanyahu's allies, and uh, some of these generals over everything from settlers to Mahmoud Abbas. There have been, I, I came across numerous reports of contentious arguments in cabinet meetings in which Smotrich or, uh, or Bennett or some other right-wing uh, politician is uh, accusing Abbas, and Netanyahu himself has accused uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, of inciting terrorism. And the Shin Bet had said repeatedly that there is, not only is there no evidence that Abbas is inciting terrorism, uh, he's trying to do the opposite. Um, and so this isn't helpful. So, so that's how we learn about some of these conversations, through leaks. Of course, the ex-generals and the ex-security uh, officials are very open, or many of them are very open on their views. And there's very, a very robust civil society in Israel uh, composed of uh, these uh, ex-generals that speak out on these issues all the time. Uh, hi, my name is Max Legoy. Um, I'm an intern for the Center for Israel Studies and also a minor. Um, you talked a lot about how the Israeli public and how they vote, and you mentioned how a lot of the time Netanyahu uses the us versus them 
uh, saying, but, uh, them being the Palestinians. So my question is, what about the Palestinians that reside in Israel that have voting power, some of which are enlisted in the IDF, many of which are translators in Gaza right now? How are they influencing the IDF side, the general side, within this, I guess, tear between Netanyahu and the generals? Sorry, how, they're, how the Arab Israelis are influencing the IDF? Yeah within Israel itself, and like, how are they influencing this divide between Netanyahu and the generals? Are, are they involved with this at all, or are they completely? I, I think they're, they're involved more indirectly than directly in many of the contentious debates and the culture wars. What we saw um, a year and a half ago, or a couple years ago, was unprecedented, which was one of the Arab Israeli leaders, Mansour Abbas, not to confuse him with Mahmoud Abbas, um, who decided to join the government. And this was the government led by uh, Naftali, uh, Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid, the so-called change government, um, which in the past was never done. So this could be a sign for uh, greater involvement of at least some Arab-Israeli uh, political parties in the process. But up until now, they've been pretty marginalized. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jacob Martin. Um, I'm an alumni of uh, American University. And I just kind of had a quick, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on one issue. I know a uh, comment was posed earlier about um, how it should be construed as democratic uh, voting for right-wing candidates because you kind of assume that that would um, be in tandem with security. But I, I kind of feel like that should be decoupled somewhat. Maybe that's my personal perspective. Um, I just look at a lot of different examples. I mean. Let's go back to the 90s or, some, or even prior to that, too. Uh, Netanyahu, every few years, would have some wonderful, beautiful chart he'd show to the Knesset that would say, X country, usually Iraq, later Iran, after we invaded, that they'd have a bomb in a couple years, this or that, too, which was disingenuous, let's be honest, because all of the um, intelligence, whether it's Mossad, Shinbet, as well as CIA, MI6, et cetera, said that that was not the case. So just things like that, I think it's kind of important to delineate between the two, because I think you can vote for a general, even if he is in associated with a left-wing party because he, I mean, in my, again, personal opinion, is more pragmatic in that sense, too, because um, you can go beyond that to the JCPOA. We can look at people's responses to that then and now, and they're pretty similar from the security establishment. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because it seems like the whole Netanyahu, Mr. Security thing, I don't think it's really right to, again, couple, you know, right-wing nationalism, or Likud party, other things like that with actual security when a lot of the policies of Netanyahu have really been detrimental, in my opinion, to Israeli society as a whole. And, and that's a great point. I also, I also want, I don't want to embarrass you, but Jake was a star student of mine many years ago here. So he's I was a, in your first class. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's right. Um, and I'm still 25, and so I don't know how you're already in your 30s. I'm 19. I'm doing great. <laughs> um, so, uh, so to answer, so I, I agree with your, with your observation, with your comment. Mm. Um, one thing I should note, though, is they're not necessarily these ex-generals, with a few exceptions like Yair Golan, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, they generally don't try to associate with the left because the left in Israel collapsed in the wake of the Second Intifada. So there really is a very small uh, Israeli left. So maybe they call moderate is a better word. I'm sorry. Maybe moderate. Is yeah. A better so word. They, that's and that's the thing. They're trying to capture the center, really, um, and and maybe even soft right wing voters. Um, but yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, as I said, with the, the Netanyahu's political magic has been to convince enough people that he is Mr. Security and that a harder line that he takes, whether it's toward Iran or the Palestinians or anybody, or even towards an American president who is critical, yeah. is going to somehow lead to greater security for Israel. And that is a message that has resonated over the years uh, in Israel. And despite all the efforts by the former uh, the veterans of Israel's security establishment to counter that, um, it's fallen largely on deaf ears. And only now, I think, not due to the generals, but due to the recent developments, mm -hmm. are, uh, are, I think, people starting to get the idea that maybe he's not Mr. Security after all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank I had you. a really, really quick question, too, just about OSIRIC, uh, public opinion in regard to that, the bombing in Iraq of the nuclear facilities. Uh, Did that help the IDF whatsoever? Uh, you, mean in 81, you mean in 80, 1981? Post 73, I'm thinking yeah, post 73. Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't remember what the Israeli response was. I think it was probably positive because yeah. um, this was done right during Menachem Begin's re-election okay. campaign, and he won handily. So oh, just a it certainly didn't harm his yeah. re-election chances. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's. 
No. Do you want to try this one, maybe? Kai, you did a great job. Um, I'm Ron Carmel. I teach at Kogod, and I grew up in Israel. Um, I grew up in, in, in the culture. The culture was that the best and the brightest become generals in Israel. And, and, and that's, that's part of the culture that I kind of uh, I grew up with. So Guy, he, listening to this wonderful presentation, I want you to explain to me why the generals are bringing Israel into the situation that it is today. Today is day 150 what of the war? 150 something? The, the core of the, the main battles of the War of Independence took a few months into the summer of 48. The Sinai campaign was a week. The Six Day War, how many days was the Six Day War? Mm -hmm. the, um, the October War of 1973 was about three weeks. And I can go on. We are now almost half a year into the war. The best and the brightest generals are letting this this crazy prime minister lead Israel into the abyss, 150 something days. Explain to me, as someone who's, who has been talking to them, how do the generals agree to this? Well, I mean, in, in a democracy, I think generals can't really set their own policies, right? They can advise, they can speak up, but they can't, um, they can't disregard the orders from the government. I think where your question is really uh, pertinent, though, is in the generals that are currently sitting in this kind of national emergency unity government. Uh, the, uh, and I'm referring here to Benny Gantz, the former IDF, IDF chief of staff, and another former IDF chief of staff, uh, Gadi Eisenkot, his successor, who are together leading the most popular party in Israel today. Um, and kind of serving as a sort of opposition to Netanyahu, but within the government, uh, in order to pursue this war. And what was really interesting was, maybe this was several weeks ago or a month ago, Eisenkot, who, by the way, lost his son, lost a son in this war, uh, gave an interview uh, in one of the Israeli, to one of the Israeli broadcasters in which he was asked, is Netanyahu doing this for national security purposes, or is he, does he have a, a vested interest in pursuing this war indefinitely for his own uh, private gain? And Eisenkot said, I'm not sure. He said, I don't know. He attacked him within the interview. So I think it'll be interesting what, uh, to see how long uh, these ex-generals are going to remain by the, you know, in this government. Um, there's some pressure on them to leave, but there's also countervailing pressure on them to stay. Uh, but they're the ones who are now politicians who are going to have to call the shots, not the generals themselves, not the active generals. But it's, a, it's an interesting question. Hi. Um, my name's Theo Springer. I'm in one of your other classes as well. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. So that's better. I'm a little too tall for that one. Um, but I was wondering, with the generals losing support for Netanyahu, what's the role in the military for not deposing, but opposing Netanyahu's um, goals for this war? Because it's clear that they're antithetical to national security and international, uh, I guess, recognition. Um, what line is drawn when they can no longer support him? Well, that's kind of uh, similar, I think, in some respect to uh, uh, Professor Carmel's question and, and, and observation about um, you know, how, where, what is the red line. And it's not clear. Um, I think that there's a lot of nervousness that Netanyahu's goal uh, of total destruction of Hamas is, is not feasible, it's not realistic. They share the goal of trying to destroy Hamas, right? Nobody disagrees with that, but, uh, but, but they don't think it's realistic. And Eisenkot has said as much, okay? Um, and so the question is, where, at what point will they draw the line? They're also very uncomfortable with the, uh, the growing rift we're seeing in US-Israel relations. Um, and uh, they don't think it is in Israel's interest to have this confrontation with uh, the, uh, the Biden uh, administration over this, over this war. Um, but, but I don't know exactly what's happening behind closed doors. I mean, a lot of these conversations are taking place behind the closed doors. We only read about them in the newspapers. Um, and I don't know if there's even a consensus among the generals as to at what point do they, you know, do they draw the line here. 
Hi, Guy. My name is Sibel Oktay. I'm an associate yes. professor of political science, uh, a big fan of your work, a friend of the community, uh, and, uh, and I'm so glad to hear you talk today. It was phenomenal. So I have two questions. Number one, you know, we talk all about Netanyahu, but we also know that he's in a coalition. Mm -hmm. And even though the opposition is very much in, in a disastrous mode right now, we also know that he cannot concoct an, a, a coalition with parties in the opposition, so he time and time again turns to these far-right parties, um, sort of feeding into that populist frenzy, I assume. So I'm, so the first question is, how much of this um, war between Netanyahu and the generals, let's say, how much of it is about him versus about his, uh, his need for co-opting these junior parties in the government and ultimately feeding into this sort of feedback loop where the longer he is with these bedfellows, the farther he grows outside and, and sort of falls out with, with the generals and the IDF. And the second question is, what should we do as the United States going forward? Um, circling back to your comments about Chuck Schumer's statement on the Senate, uh, Senate floor, what could we do to make sure that the hostages are released, to make sure that this disastrous situation in Gaza is resolved, and so ultimately both Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace? Thank you. Okay, two uh, not easy questions to answer. Um, so thank you very much for those questions. Um, I would say that uh, Netanyahu plays an essential role in uh, this whole debate, uh, which is why I wrote the book, um, because he is really the common thread uh, by the way, Netanyahu himself, I should note, doesn't uh, personally attack the IDF chief. He doesn't personally attack the, uh, the Shin Bet head or the Mossad chiefs. He has his allies do that and his son. Uh, he doesn't do it himself because he knows, at least for himself, where to draw that line. But, but more importantly, uh, Netanyahu is, I mentioned this, he's called a political magician. And one of the things he's done over the years is do, there's, there's no red line. So any, anything that he needs to do to preserve his political survival, uh, he's willing to do. And that includes uh, integrating the most extreme far-right elements in Israeli society, including people who had been so marginalized, he himself wouldn't have necessarily thought of talking to them, let alone uh, appointing them government ministers a decade or two ago. Uh, and yet today, for his political survival, he needs to do that. So he orchestrated the merger of two far-right parties because he saw the polls and he saw that there was no way that both of them would be able to make it into the Knesset on their own. And the price he had to pay was uh, giving them not only senior posts for which they were not qualified, but enhancing their posts, uh, much to the chagrin of the security establishment. And I write a little bit about that as well in the book. With respect to the US role, um, I am uh, convinced, and not everybody I know is, but I'm convinced that the U.S. role is essential to Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. Uh, that without a strong and robust uh, American mediation efforts, there's not, we're never going to see an agreement uh, on their own. Um, the U.S. is the adult in the room. Not always, but the U.S. today is the adult in the room. And um, we, there, was, there would not have been a peace uh, treaty between Israel and Egypt had it not been for Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy in the 70s and the disengagement agreements that ensued, followed by uh, Carter's uh, brokered uh, Camp David talks that led to the first peace treaty. Bill Clinton, uh, also uh, very, very essential in forging um, peace between Israel and Jordan and um, trying to get the sides to, uh, to agree to a deal that obviously fell apart at the last minute. Um, at Camp David, the, the Camp David summit of July 2000. Bush tried his hand, they don't always succeed, but without the US role, I don't think there's a chance. So I think the US role is essential, uh, and the US has to figure out how to use its leverage. This is something that Schumer and other members of Congress are openly talking about today, how to best uh, utilize that leverage uh, to, on the one hand, maintain a robust uh, security and diplomatic support for Israel, which is our main ally in the region, our most important ally in the region, but at the same time, use the leverage when it's necessary to get the Israelis to budge on certain issues that they haven't been able to do. Um, thank you. I think we're over here on this side. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, who worked on some of the issues you talked about. I was in the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. I was in Jordan, working with Israel, between Israel and Jordan, also in Gaza, also in the West Bank. 
I was there when the war began. It was a frightening moment. We were in Jerusalem, and we couldn't understand what was going on on the border at that time. My brother lives about 20 miles from Gaza, and so the, uh, we heard the planes and we saw the rockets. And when I speak, spoke to him, we talked about the Bibi's idea of staying in Gaza, of occupying Gaza, and now there's a movement, a Zionist movement, I guess, by a lady named Weissman, who said that Israel should go back and occupy Gaza and go back to Guz Katif and go set up uh, settlements over there. But my brother and I were talking and said, what the hell is Israel going to do with four, five million Palestinians? How, what kind of a country is that going to be who occupy Gaza and also the West Bank? And the other question I have, which was asked a little bit before, was also, what is the position of the Israeli, Israeli Arabs? They've been very quiet. It's very interesting that nothing has happened. Uh, uh, Aqsa has been quiet during Ramadan despite the call for uprising and so on. Mm -hmm. That's my, my second. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your comments. Thank you. And um, I think that the response to your first question is very easy, which is that's not going to happen. Um, and Netanyahu himself has publicly stated that Israel will, uh, there's zero intention for Israel to go back to uh, you know, building Jewish settlements in Gaza. So that's, that's just, that's what the far right wants to do, but that's uh, far from popular and that's just not going to happen. The, um, the Arab-Israeli uh, response to the events of October 7th is very interesting because in the same IDI survey that I mentioned in my talk about the IDF being the most popular, uh, most trusted, excuse me, institution in Israel today, um, in the past, about 20-something percent of uh, Arab Israelis uh, expressed a trust in the IDF, and that's not surprising. Uh, but today, it's over 40%. Um, and so we're seeing a rise in support uh, by Arab Israelis uh, for the IDF, interestingly enough. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that they share the same vision or the same ideas and that they're not critical in other ways, but uh, they're p potentially going to become more and more of a political force in the coming years. First, I want to say <clears throat> it was a wonderful presentation, and I'm sure it's a wonderful book to read. But one, um, my question really deals with what I would say is the elephant in the room. While we're looking at Hamas and looking to end the war, to get the hostages back and to d disable, disarm Hamas, 60,000 uh, Israeli residents in the north had to be evacuated because of what's going on there. Hezbollah, has, uh, it has been mentioned before that this is, this is a much bigger threat because it, this, this is Iran. This is a, the arm of Iran. And um, I remember just shortly before October 6th, I can't remember a week or two, very shortly before, the, the, um, the Khomeini, or Khomeini, however, however you pronounce it, commented that uh, soon Israel will cease to exist, which tells me he knew what was going to happen in Gaza. Well, that's not going to happen as far as Israel ceasing to exist. But to deal with the two fronts, uh, Hamas, well, you could say three fronts, Hamas, this, uh, the uh, elimination or, or disabling of Hamas, uh, organizing a valid or an institution that, the, that can rule the Gaza and the West Bank, which really is a creation that will take men a long time, but at the same time, they have to juggle what's happening in the north. So I guess my question really vo revolves around, this is the time when we really need the best and the brightest, as someone mentioned that that's the thought that the IDF was. What are they doing with regard to uh, tr training or retraining or reorienting the training of the IDF to be able to de handle the political situation and yet all this terrible situation with regard to the two fronts. Yeah, so this is a little outside the scope yeah, of, I uh, of my that. book. Um, the IDF for years uh, planned for uh, a potential future war with Hezbollah, and this is one of the major <clears throat> failures uh, that I think we'll read and, and see more about once the investigations take place. But the general notion in both the political and the military establishments was that the biggest, the single biggest threat to Israel, external threat, uh, is Hezbollah, not Hamas. 
because the assumption, and it is proven to be a false assumption, is that Hamas uh, has no business attacking Israel in any significant way. They're, they're going to try to govern Gaza, and that their interest is to, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be too busy trying to uh, and, you know, build an effective governance and government in Gaza to bother with Israel. And so they underestimated the, both the ability and the willingness of Hamas to, uh, to attack and inflict damage on Israel. Um, so, so when it comes to Hezbollah, there has, there's already been preparations for, for years. That wouldn't be less surprising, but obviously opening up a new front would be uh, terribly devastating and it would escalate a war that neither the Israelis and certainly the Americans do not want. Which is, and, and it's not clear that Nasrallah wants that either, for that matter, even though he's under pressure to, uh, to enter the war as well. Um, I think we're almost out of time, so maybe we can kind of keep the, the questions very, very brief, and I'm going to try to keep my answers brief as well. Uh, okay, two decades long trends going in different directions. Collapse of the uh, Israeli left. I'm Stephen Stern, yeah. by the way. Collapse of the Israeli left, mm -hmm. and security officials, generals, even from the Second Intifada, uh, who had responsibility for military rule mm -hmm. over Palestinians, mm -hmm becoming, as the right was calling, leftists, seeing right. these realities That's on right. the ground. I'm not saying that there's a rise of the left coming with sure. Yair Golan, but you see a general who's sort of embodying and trying to go in, in politics. What do you see in the future in terms of civil military um, notions such as that it, as Israel goes through monumental changes over yeah. these next years and more? coming into the political discourse in Israel? Sure. I'm hesitant to, uh, I've been hesitant to predict the future ever since I predicted a landslide victory for Hillary Clinton in 2016, <laughs> which didn't quite pan out. Um, uh, what I will say, and by the way, I have my colleague Dan Arbel here, would be a great person for you to ask that question to uh, as well afterwards. Um, I, look, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. What I will say is that your observation that uh, the generals, uh, the one, especially the ones that have presided over the occupation in the West Bank, are the ones that tend to be the most dovish uh, and the most interested in ending the occupation and in pursuing uh, some sort of two-state solution. So I think that's very true. It's not entirely clear who is going to go into politics, who's going to make it. I do think we're going to see a political shakeup, though. Uh, the, uh, some of the current crop of politicians are going to leave the scene and a new crop will arise. And some of them are going to be, as we already know, these ex-generals. So whether they work together, uh, in what constellation they will work together, and also who is going to replace Netanyahu uh, when he finally leaves the scene is another factor in terms of what's going to happen in the future of Israeli politics. OK. I think. Uh, did you have? I'll be very, I'll be very, okay, I'll be very sure. quick. I'm sorry. I was just going to say to one of the earlier comments, too, yeah. about uh, Khomeini recently saying something. He'd said that since, what, 89, since he took over from Khomeini. So it's a lot of bluster for domestic purposes. Same as Hassan Nasrallah, same as Netanyahu talking about nuclear thresholds and all of this stuff, too. But my question was about an earlier statement made about why is this taking so long. And I, I, I was wondering, from your perspective, with the Israeli public, do they are they able to kind of delineate between 48, 67, where they were purely conventional wars, versus other things like you mentioned, um, Lebanon, 82 to 2000 or whatever, the Vietnam, so to speak, do they recognize that, um, that, for example, in this current crisis with Lebanon and other things too, you're dealing with non-state actors. And because of that too, you're not dealing with conventional forces. We can go into tunneling a million different things too. Do they kind of recognize that there is longer, um, like a longer end game than per se, just a natural conventional conflict as we've seen? And I'm, I'm not sure most Israelis think in those terms or are like analyzing it in, in, this, in that kind of like sophisticated way. Okay. Um, but I do think that as a whole, they trust the institution of the IDF um, much more than any of their politicians, much more than the Knesset, much more than this government or other governments. And uh, it's the one force that we're most, it's the one institution that most Israelis, not everybody, but most Israelis will, will join. So I feel like there is um, a natural inclination to give the IDF the benefit of the doubt even when they make mistakes. Okay. Um, that does not translate, however, into significant political clout. Okay. So there's a difference between uh, trusting the institution and, uh, and then voting for people who come out of that institution in a national election. 
Um, mm -hmm. We are going to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it. And we have uh, refreshments, uh, coffee for anybody who I put to sleep. Uh, that's out there as well. So, uh, and, and a book signing, and the book signing, yes.